one more. Great, we're gonna begin recording the webinar. So, and I'm gonna kick us off um, and welcome everyone to this installment of Grow Your Own Salad, uh, which is a program of Our Water, Our World, which we'll learn more about. And this is sponsored by the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, which is where I work. Um, my name is Emily Corwin. And it's co-sponsored um, with the Vallejo Flood and Wastewater District. And our instructor today is the amazing Suzanne Von Tempo. And Suzanne works as an environmental educator teaching the principles of integrated pest management for sustainable, eco-friendly pest management around the home and garden. Suzanne is the owner of Plant Harmony and the IPM, Integrated Pest Management Advocate Program Coordinator for Our Water, Our World. And she was recognized for excellence in her field, winning the 2013 IPM Innovators Award. And we're so lucky to have her with us today. And this is the second installment in our spring webinar series. And I personally learned so much during the last one. So look forward to learning again today and um, continuing on to the future. So with Suzanne, with that, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And again, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon and in honor of Earth Day that I would just like to share um, that I am particularly excited to talk about growing food because I think growing food is one of the most important things we can do right now, not only for the, our health, but also for the health of our ecosystems and our planet. So thank you. So we're gonna go through slides for a good solid 45 minutes. If you've joined my programs before, you know I've got a lot to share, uh, but I'm gonna really um, try to keep it at 45 and then we'll leave time for your questions at the end. So please, as questions pop up, go ahead and drop them into the Q&A. If you've got any comments at all, um, or if anything is going, um, you know, uh, technical difficulties, please put them in the chat. And then what we're going to learn this afternoon is uh, we're gonna set our food gardens up for success. We're going to learn how to plant our food gar gardens. Um, it is targeted towards salads and salad ingredients, but it's not limit limited to just salads. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how to water efficiently and effectively, the benefits of planting cover crops around our gardens, and then more additional resources. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Our Water, Our World uh, program, I will share that it is a national award-winning program that partners with water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. We provide uh, public education in the form of integrated pest management, which will guide folks to less toxic pest solutions. Uh, you might recognize our materials at your local uh, hardware store or garden center, uh, but the literature rack that is in the photo on the left, that is a kiosk that has these uh, pamphlets that you can take home with you and read to learn how to solve a variety of pest problems such as ants, aphids, rats and mice, cockroaches, yellow jackets, and so forth. You'll also notice on the pesticides in the aisle little blue tags that will identify which of the pesticides are going to be less toxic and eco-friendly with the intention of not uh, being a pollutant to the waterways. We've recently launched some QR codes, so you might even see some QR code posters in the aisle where you can scan and have direct access to not only the Our Water, Our World website, but also to those fact sheets. You can get more information at ourwaterourworld.org. And the reason why uh, the our water or the main uh, principal message that our water our world likes to share is that understand when we have rain like we are currently getting which is wonderful uh, any any water any of that rainwater that isn't um, soaking into the ground around your property is going to run off 
the property down the driveway over the sidewalk. This can certainly happen with irrigation breaks or irrigation that isn't adjusted properly. And along the way, that water is picking up any pollutants that might be around the property. And these pollutants sometimes are invisible as in the form of pesticides or synthetic fertilizers, but it's not limited with just pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. It also can go for any cleaning agents that we might use for washing our car or washing the windows around our house, or if there's pet waste or any litter or anything like that that can also get picked up with this water and it can flow directly into the storm drains, which is a direct connection straight out to our local waterways, bringing with it those toxic pollutants. So that's the main principle of integrated pest management, I'm sorry, of the Our Water, Our World program is to uh, uh, share how to reduce uh, pesticide usage around the home and garden. And we do that with uh, the, pet, the principles of integrated pest management. And integrated pest management is uh, a comprehensive um, kind of decision-making process that uh, uses science-based strategies to solve pest problems. It allows us to look at the garden as a whole system and uh, really, I look a little closer to identify what the problem really is. Oftentimes what we see are symptoms of a problem. So when we see something that isn't correct or isn't just right, uh, we might ask a few questions like what really is going on? And is this truly a problem or is this something we can live with knowing that it will, uh, it's a short uh, cycle and it will correct itself in uh, an amount of time? A lot of integrated pest management is preventing problems, identifying them, but then preventing them from happening again. And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, pest prevention in our program today. But identif identification is key. And if we're not able to identify the problem, it'll be really difficult to try to uh, resolve that problem. And if we need to take action, the action steps in integrated pest management are called controls. So there's cultural controls, which is increasing the health of the garden, which we'll definitely be talking about um, in this program. Mechanical controls, which are going to be, you know, traps, barriers, other tools, um, that fencing, anything that could prevent uh, pests from happening with, um, you know, physical uh, um, tools and so forth, so forth. And then biological controls, which are inviting living organisms in to manage the pest problems, such as ladybugs. And then there's chemical controls, which are the pesticides, but we're always going to use these as a last resort when we've exercised all of the other uh, actions and always choosing the least toxic and the most eco friendly product available. So with that, let's talk about setting our food gardens up for success. So the first thing I'd like to share, um, and one of the most important steps that oftentimes gets overlooked is uh, understanding what the sun exposure in the garden is. So this is gonna be really important depending on the different types of foods that we wanna grow. So full sun means six hours or more of direct sunlight during the summer months. Um, if we happen to get fog, that's um, UV can still move through that fog. Um, and oftentimes we're looking at our gardens in the winter or um, during the spring and fall uh, where we might have a little less direct sunlight in some areas because of the way the sun moves. But this is really going to be for our uh, summer months. We are looking at six or more hours of direct sunlight for full sun locations. Part sun to part shade is going to be three to six hours of direct sun. And this is typically um, referring to the morning. This is going to be the morning sunlight. Uh, the afternoon sunlight, uh, though it might be um, three to six hours, understand that that sunlight is a lot hotter. It's much stronger. And if that's the case, if that's what your environment has, please talk to uh, the knowledgeable people at your local garden center 
to select the best plant for that afternoon hot sun. And then dappled sun, or there will be filtered sunlight all day. So filtered from maybe a tree, tree canopy or a lattice or something like that. And then shade means no direct sunlight. And then the shade could be from a, a screen or a fence, a house, uh, maybe a hedgerow, something like that. So that's, that's where we're gonna start. And then from there, we wanna find a location we can decide, are we going to uh, grow our food in the open ground or in uh, containers on the deck or the patio or in raised beds? And then are these, uh, is our growing location going to be up against a, a house or a garage or a fence? Because these locations, especially if they're set, uh, south facing can be rather hot. So keep that in mind also. I know there's many areas of Solano County that can get very hot in the summer months. So if this is the case, just pay attention. I've got some solutions that will help you uh, cool those areas down towards the end of our program. So when we're planting in the ground, there are some benefits. It's going to be less expensive. We have more space. Space is a little bit more flexible, and it's also not a permanent uh, structure. However, some things to consider is that we have to work with the existing soil. If the soil has had toxins in it, or if the soil is really heavy clay or super sandy or just not ideal for some reason, where that's the soil that we have to work with. Uh, gophers can enter the area. Gophers um, are quite significant, at least where I live, and uh, can do a number on in-ground planting, eating those root systems. Uh, also bending down. Sometimes bending down isn't easy for us. Uh, so maybe that's something to consider. And then when we're planting in the ground, um, believe it or not, it does use more water because the water actually can move through that soil um, and uh, move down and out. So it's not as controlled as it might be in a, a container or a raised bed. So in a raised bed, the benefits are that we can actually now put a lining of gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth along the bottom of that raised bed to prevent gophers from coming up and eating the root systems. We now can control the soil. Uh, so if that soil was unfavorable, now we can kind of start from scratch and put some nice, uh, healthy, good quality soil into those raised beds. And believe it or not, we are going to be using less water because the water is really targeted to just this planting area. Some things to consider though, is the cost of the materials. Could cost a little bit more to build a raised bed and to add that soil. Uh, we're going to have a limited growing space. Now, these red beds in this picture are pretty long, so there, there's a lot of space to grow, but not everyone has a uh, unlimited amount of space in their garden, so maybe their raised beds might be a little smaller, maybe two feet by three feet. Okay. And then these are somewhat uh, permanent. So they're not completely permanent. We could always empty them out and move them, but you know, once in place, they're in place. But then uh, we can also grow food in containers um, and containers can be really beneficial for smaller spaces. So those of us that maybe only all we have is a patio or a deck, we can absolutely grow food in uh, containers on in those smaller spaces. Containers are more mobile. We can actually you will usually pick them up and move them around. Uh, we don't have to worry about gophers accessing those root systems. We get to control that soil as well, adding potting soil in this case. And then we're also going to see that we will use less water because again, we're targeting the water to uh, this limited area. However, it is very important that when we do plant in containers that there are drainage holes, okay? Uh, we're going to, um, um, if they don't have drainage holes already, we are going to drill some holes that are at least a quarter inch in diameter, if not up to half an inch. And uh, please um, allow for many, we want to uh, drill many holes. So this container here, I believe has about 10 and keep in mind, it is about two and a half feet in diameter. 
We really want to have nice, good drainage. Okay, and from there, we want to consider pest prevention. Now, uh, you might not consider some of these pests, but let me tell you, uh, when we plant, they will come. Uh, many of these pests like our food just as much as we do. So please uh, keep this in mind or take the precautions before your plants are already grown and are too big to maybe put some type of a frame around. So these are some really great pictures I got on Instagram. You know, this is what people do and they like to show how they're, you know, growing their food crops. A uh, picture on the lower left is a frame that has bird netting over it. Now this is gonna be excellent to keep out deer, birds, raccoons and squirrels, maybe cats and dogs, but rodents such as rats would still be able to access the size of that hole. They'd be able to go right through that hole. Uh, the top middle and the lower right, these are, are going to be framed in gardens. I love the one in the top middle. That's my most favorite. I can't wait to build one myself. This is actually like a walk-in greenhouse, but it's just framed out with that quarter inch hardware cloth to prevent uh, you know, deer, birds, rats, all, all of the critters that can come in. However, pollinators can still access, uh, they can still come in and buzz around and leave and pollinate your plants without any um, issues. So I just wanted to show that this is uh, what people do nowadays because all of these pest problems really happen <laughs> and it could be quite a problem. But then from there, we're always going to start with healthy soil. We are going to amend our existing soil with compost when we're planting our plants, or we're going to top dress or side dress with compost, uh, you know, a layer of compost around those root zones of the plant. We want to build healthy soil with compost. Um, this is probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, soil should not be an afterthought. The more uh, energy and the more attention we put into building healthy soil, the happier and healthier your plants are going to be. You're going to use less resources, including using less water, which is uh, a big concern these days. But our goal is to have about 5% organic matter in the soil, and that would be in the form of compost. And the reason why is because it's going to improve that soil structure. It is going to actually make the clay soil easier to work. Um, it's going to add air pockets to that clay soil. And then it's also going to make that sandy soil stick together a little better, actually, uh, you know, create a little bit more of a, um, um, more organic matter to pro provide more nutrients for those root systems. When we add compost to the soil, it also increases the amount of water that can be stored in that soil. It's really going to help that soil become more like a sponge. And that's really the goal. Now, some of you might think, yeah, but I've got clay soil. And let me tell you that water is staying around. But when we add that compost, it actually starts to break up those tiny, tiny particles. And it allows for um, more air pockets so that the root systems can actually grow through with more ease which then increases that plant roots ability to get nutrients and water uh, more efficiently. And then when we add compost to the soil, we're actually also able to filter out any pollutants from that runoff I mentioned earlier. But when we're at, Okay, so we, could, we have to purchase the soil, we have to purchase the compost, and uh, we could always go to a landscape supply yard and get these products in bulk. However, most of us are just going to the local garden center or hardware store and buying them in bags. So what I wanted to share is for in-ground planting or raised beds, oftentimes what we're going to get are things called uh, planting mix or planting compost or soil amendment. There are also products called raised bed mix. And that's really what we want to get for our raised beds. But if the raised beds already have soil in it, then we're going to be amending those raised beds. That's, we're going to be amending that soil with these other products. And then if we are planting in pots or containers, we are always going to purchase something called potting soil, okay? Potting soil is for pots. And all of those other things are going to be 
for um, soil amendments for our raised beds and for our in-ground planting. What I'd like to share is please stay away from topsoil. Topsoil is really designed just to fill in any type of um, holes um, that might be like in the lawn from a dog digging or something like that, or from a gopher. It's topsoil is really uh, very sandy and very heavy. And it's really intended just to kind of fill in some gaps and create uh, correct grade issues on a small level. Then from there, we want to decide which plants to grow. This is always the big question that I'm even faced with right now. I've got my stack of seeds and I'm like, gosh, what do I want to grow this year? But we want to always start with what you really like to eat. What are some of your favorite ingredients that you like to put in a salad? Well, lettuces, of course, tomatoes, carrots, radishes, onions, cucumbers, spinach, spinach, peas, berries. I mean, the list goes on. It could be any kind of salad you want. And um, as I shared, it's just, we really want to get started with just food that we like to eat. I like choosing heirloom varieties. Heirlooms are going to be uh, plants that are open pollinated, uh, non-GMO and not hybridized. Uh, and the reason why I love heirloom varieties is because they're ideal for our climate. We live in a Mediterranean climate and most the heirlooms come from Mediterranean regions. Uh, when we plant heirlooms, understand that oftentimes many of those varieties have these root systems that really dive deep because they typically are coming from uh, areas that don't have as much water. They certainly don't, or I should say, they don't get as much rainwater. They have summer dry climates like ours. And so they're going to be typically more drought tolerant uh, because those root systems are diving deep to access water that is uh, deeper down. So not only are they going to be more delicious and be more interesting, they're also going to be water savers and ideal for our climate. Now, uh, from there, we're going to look at the difference between annual food crops and perennial food crops. So annual food crops are food crops that we would be planting every year. So those lettuces, once that plant, um, we've eaten that plant, it's pretty much done and we'll have to plant new seeds or uh, new plants to get more plants to grow. Um, and that goes for chard and kale, uh, tomatoes, peppers, spinach, radishes, carrots, cucumbers, green onions, and, and so forth. But these are just, uh, wanted to give you an idea, these are just a, a one season life cycle is typically what it is. And then after they're done, they're done. And then perennial food crops are going to have a two year or longer lifespan. So these are plants that we're going to plant once and we're going to be getting food from them year after year, which is one of my most favorite things. I love planting perennials because they give you a lot of bang for your buck. So one of my favorites are going to be the scarlet runner beans, artichokes, asparagus, tree collards, rhubarbs, berries. There's so many berries that we can plant that are actually perennial, um, sorrel, bunching onions, and chives. And the list goes on. It's not, uh, that's just the start. But I found this really cool planting chart on the, um, on the Solano Master Gardeners. It's from um, the University of California um, website and it's the vegetable planting guide. So I really encourage you to check this out because this is gonna help us identify when we plant these food crops. Okay, um, that's really important because some food crops are going to prefer to grow in the cooler months, while others can grow during the uh, spring, summer, and fall months when we've got a little bit more heat. And I did email everyone a link to that um, PDF. Uh, and if you didn't get that, I can send it out again afterwards. So when we um, buy uh, seeds or when we buy our plants, they come with tags or those seeds have uh, the seed packet. And the tags and the packets give us a lot of information. So these are really important to understand. We wanna know um, how uh, fast we're going to be able to harvest these food crops. 
how fast, and it's typically from time of germination. So that's why you see on the purple tag right in the front, um, the lettuce, it kind of depends on when you purchased it. That's why that um, uh, the days of harvest is so broad, but then also understand you can start harvesting before that plant is even mature. We always can start harvesting those lettuces, those outside leaves as the plant continues to grow. And then something else to ask yourself, are you going to start your plants from seed? And from that, you know, when we start from seed, we have some choices. We can sow the seeds into starting pots, like these six packs and so forth, or we can direct sow them in the soil. We can also buy plants. We can, you know, are you gonna buy your starts? Uh, buying starts is, you know, these are plants that are already ready to go. They're already, you know, they're seedlings that are, you know, a few inches tall. Um, you don't have to worry about thinning them or having too many plants. Cause when we plant by seed, we have a lot of seeds. And when we, uh, uh, oftentimes we will have to thin them because it, it's hard to get one little seed per area exact. So, and then when we have a pack of seeds, we're kind of limited to that variety. So we might have lots of one type of plant. Whereas if we buy plants in these like little four inch pots or in cell packs, we can actually get a lot more variety. So there's pros and cons to both of them. But when we buy, uh, plants in six packs or other types of cell packs that oftentimes there's a lot of plants per cell. So in this case, it's intended to separate those plants. So you might get a little nervous about that. Like you might wreck them or you might hurt their roots, but it's very easy. Essentially, you're going to pop that cell out and you're going to massage that soil away from those roots and you're going to slowly massage the roots to the point where you can actually separate them with ease and then you're going to plant them around. I had a cell pack the other day of lettuce. Um, well, it was actually a couple of weeks ago. And I had from one six pack that cost me $4, I had about 36 plants. So uh, you can get a lot of plants for not very much money if you look for um, these types of uh, multi-planted cell packs. But then if we're buying from a... Uh, a cell pack that is more um, established or if, like if it's a single plant per cell or if it's a single plant per uh, four inch pot, what we're gonna wanna do is we're going to take that handy dandy tool, that plant tag that the plant came with and we want to score those roots. We wanna tease those roots a little bit, not a lot, but enough to really encourage those roots to start to grow out and down. What we want to do is prevent them from growing around each other. We really wanna to start to get them to grow out and down. And then when we plant, we want to plant in um, clusters or on a diamond grid or on a hex pattern, a little closer than you would expect. And the reason why is because when these plants actually grow, they're now shading the root systems from um, the heat of the summer which will reduce the water evaporation. So we won't have to water as often, but also it's going to keep those root systems cooler, which will benefit the health of the plant. And it's going to prevent weed seeds from growing. Now you might think this is crazy. However, I will share the way we harvest this is either harvesting every other plant as we go, or, as I mentioned with the lettuces, similar to um, the spinach and the kale and the chard, we're going to be removing those outer leaves. So the outer, large outer leaves we're going to be harvesting, we'll be cutting those and bringing them in to eat. And what we're leaving is the center of the plant that will can, can still grow. And now we're, left, we're leaving room we've opened up some space for some of the smaller plants to grow. And then the next time we come out, we're going to harvest those smaller plants because they've grown, now they're bigger. And we're going to see that the smaller plants that we harvested last time are starting to grow. So it's like this um, uh, succession of planting, you know, it's kind of ebbs and flows of how we're harvesting to keep this nice balance. And then for fast growing crops, 
we will be uh, planting in succession. So uh, radishes for one grow very quickly. So once they start to sprout, I've got my next row planted. And once that next row starts to sprout, I got my next row planted and so forth. I do this a lot with basil, with lettuces, with radishes, um, even with green beans and peas, uh, because what I want is a longer season of harvest. So I'm going to um, kind of pace out how I plant my seeds, or if I'm going to the store, I will pace out how I purchase those plants and plant them into my garden so that I can have a longer period of harvest. But when we're planting by seeds, a lot of times we have to thin the seeds. So in this case, it's always a little sad for me, but I will have to go through and uh, thin, physically pull out some of these little starts to give the plants more room to grow. This is always heartbreaking. So you can um, sometimes if it's microgreens, you can throw them in your salad. In this case, this was parsley, which I could still chop up and put in a salad. You can also feed it to the chickens put it in your compost. But what we wanna do is make sure each plant has enough space that the root systems are not too crowded because when the root systems are crowded, it's gonna stump the growth of the plant. It's going to, um, those root systems are gonna be competing for water and nutrients. So it is always nice just to give them a little bit of space. And then we're going to take advantage of companion planting. The reason why we would want to take advantage of companion planting is um, some plants will uh, detour pests, uh, but then some plants will actually attract beneficial insects. We also will plant uh, plants that um, uh, companions together that will not compete for nutrients and that's a big part of it. And overall, when we're co practicing companion planting, we're just really able to further enhance and bolster the health of that planting environment. I also emailed this planting chart. Uh, this planting chart I had gotten off of the orga uh, Heirloom Organics website. And it's very simple and basic. And I think visually it works really well for um, this program to show as a slide. However, it is very uh, minimal. There are uh, lots of fantastic uh, companting planting charts out there. Uh, so I encourage you to have a look. Uh, you'll see they're very extensive and will give you a lot more information than just this one. But this just gives you an example of what plants can uh, grow together. So asparagus really likes to be growing next to basil, tomatoes, nasturtium, and parsley, but really would not do well growing next to onions, garlic, or potatoes. So um, that's um, a really great thing to consider when we're planting our food crops. And then something else that's really challenging for us, especially if we have very small limited space, is that it's very important to rotate, rotate our crops. And um, I felt that this chart was really basic and easy because really what we wanna do is rotate in a sequence that goes uh, root crops, leafy crops, legumes, and fruit crops. If you can only get three of the four, that is fantastic. And if we only have one pot that we like to grow our tomato in every year, well, you can still practice this because then after we grow our tomatoes, we can put in some fava beans because that's gonna be our legumes. And before those fava, green, fava beans really take off and start to grow, we can actually throw in some leafy greens such as lettuce because lettuce has a very short um, time to harvest. And then by the time we've harvested the leafy greens, the legumes are starting to grow. And then by the time we're ready to plant our tomatoes, we can cut those legumes down. And there we have it. That is some basic crop rotation for one pot. From there, we want to feed with organic fertilizers. Uh, when we feed with organic fertilizers, it's the most sustainable, sustainable way to feed our plants. It actually feel, feeds that's the soil microbiology 
which then can increase the health of the soil, which can increase the health of our root systems. Organic fertilizers release nutrients um, more slowly over a longer period of time. It actually allows the plants to take the nutrients on an as need basis. Um, which then is going to prevent any uh, sudden growth spurts, which can attract pests. And then understand that also when we use organic fertilizers, we're not going to, we can't overdo it. We won't burn the plants, but more importantly is that this organic fertilizer will not run off and uh, pollute our local waterways. The thing I can share is that our food crops, our vegetables really love alfalfa meal. So in addition to that all purpose or that vegetable uh, fertilizer, that dry fertilizer that I just added to the soil when I'm planting the plants, I'm also adding equal parts of alfalfa meal. And the reason why is uh, not only does it supercharge the plants and the soil, um, it also contains a natural fatty acid growth stimulant. So it's really going to bolster the health of the root zone as well as the above ground growth. And in addition, it is really important to add earthworm castings to uh, the soil around your plants because it's also a superfood for your veggies. It contains an abundance of nutrients and minerals essential for your food crops to thrive, contains important enzymes and beneficial bacteria and humus. But more importantly, it has a very, the, the enzymes in the earthworm castings are highly effective for preventing insect pests and it also reduces diseases. So those enzymes actually move through the cells of the plant to make them um, more resistant to insects and diseases. So this is a must. And the way we get these dry fertilizers and uh, earthworm castings in the soil is we're going to put them into that planting hole at time of planting, or we're going to scratch it in to the top couple inches of the soil with a, like a cultivator or a trowel, but ideally without disturbing any plant roots. We really wanna just keep it at the surface and trust me, those uh, microorganisms will integrate all those nutrients down into the soil at the root zone where the plants can access it. And then when your plants are growing, one of my um, kind of uh, easy hacks is I like to feed with liquid fertilizers throughout the growing season because it's a heck of a lot easier just to put some of this liquid fertilizer in a watering can, fill it with water and water the root zones of my uh, food crops than scratching that fertilizer in throughout the growing season. The reason why I mention this is because when our, our food crops need a lot of food to give us food. So it's really important to fertilize them on a regular basis, at time of planting, and then one to two times a month, according to the label's directions. So please, um, this is a really important step is that we do need to fertilize and fertilizing with a really good quality organic uh, fertilizer, especially something that is a blend with the fish emulsion or fish hydrolysate, that is going to be fantastic. And the way we get this liquid fertilizer around those root zones is by adding it to our watering can, filling it up with water, and then actually just drenching that soil after those plants have been watered, we then apply the liquid fertilizer. Don't forget to plant flowers. This is a really important part of the equation. I see so many people at the garden centers with their carts filled up with all these beautiful vegetable plants. And I gotta share with them that it's really important if, if there's nothing else, go home with at least one six pack of a list, sweet alyssum and cosmos. They're going to do you more good than anything else in the garden. And the reason why is because we want to invite those beneficial insects, those pollinators, those birds and other garden allies. Understand that many, well, over 90% of the insects we see in the garden are actually beneficial. They all have a job to do. They're not all pests. Many of the beneficial insects are going to be predators eating a lot of the pest insects like aphids 
or they will uh, parasitize the pests uh, and or they will pollinate the flowers. So that's why it's so important to add flowers to your garden. The thing I can share, one of my favorites is to plant sunflowers because not only are they great for pollinators, but you can eat the seeds too. It's really fun. But something to share for any of you that have had the situation, which is blossom and rot on zucchini, this is um, a direct link to a pollinator that missed this flower. So if all of your plants are growing like this, uh, understand that zucchinis have enough energy to produce a fruit about three inches, maybe four inches before it just uh, starts to rot and fall off. If it was pollinated, it would continue to grow a perfect fruit. But this, in this case, the pollinator overlooks that flower. So if you have uh, a lot of uh, plants that required pollination and they're just not getting pollinated, there's a lot of information on the internet. There's YouTube videos that you can watch that talk about how you can self-pollinate. But this is really because of lack of pollinators. That's why it's so important to bring in a variety of flowering plants to attract them into your garden. Cover crops like fava beans are my most favorite to plant. They're easy. Uh, they grow very quickly in just about any soil condition. Um, they also provide food. I like those fava bean tips. I'll cut the top three inches of the young plants and saute them with garlic and sesame oil. It's delicious. Uh, it's also a wonderful pollinator attractant. Um, but what I can share is really important to uh, always have something growing in the soil and cover crops are really inexpensive way to keep those that soil uh, actively growing so to speak protects the soil and reduces weeds from taking over any bare spots in the soil but the reason another reason why i love the fava beans is that they grow nitrogen fixing bacteria that is why i love planting fava beans anywhere that i'm going to be planting tomatoes in the spring so i have a raised bed right now where i'm about to cut down all the fava beans to the base so that i can plant my tomatoes and those tomato roots are going to grow between the existing fava bean roots and access all of those little uh, nodes of nitrogen bacteria. And this is what I mean. When the plant starts to uh, um, uh, go into flower and before it goes and creates those beans, I'm gonna cut it at the base. I don't wanna rip it out because I want those root systems with all of that good nitrogen to stay in place. So the root systems of my other plants can uh, you know, weave together and access the benefits of those fava bean roots. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to water. So we have some choices. We can water with the hose, the watering wand, a soaker hose, or with a watering can. All of these are really great. But when we water, we want to make sure we're watering deeply because we really want to encourage deep root systems, okay? Understand that this awesome um, graph that I got from Roots Demystified, a really cool book by Robert Cork. This is actually, uh, this grid is uh, feet, not inches. So see those beets, those beet roots are going down about 10 feet. Tomato roots are going down about four feet. Same with peppers, okay? That's um, soil, um, if the soil allows it to, but understand that roots are growing a lot deeper than we think. So we're going to irrigate plants differently as they grow. So here's a seedling. I just love this illustration that I found online. When that little seedling germinates, that root system's maybe just a quarter of an inch. We might need to water that with the spritzer two, three times a day to keep that soil moist, okay? It's gonna dry, dry out a little bit and then we need to mist it again. But as that root system grows, we might then now just use that watering can or a watering wand to water. We're gonna water uh, about an inch deeper than the root systems are. And then we're not watering again until the top inch or so is dry. So as the plants grow, we're watering deeper and we're allow as those plants grow and we're watering deeper, we're also letting that soil dry because those deeper roots still have access to moisture. 
similar process happens when we're buying plants. We're gonna have the plants in that pot. We take that pot off. We see that root system was limited to just what the shape of that pot was. We're gonna remember, take that handy dandy tool and we're going to tease the sides of those roots to open them up. And then when we plant them, we're always gonna focus the water where the, the roots are currently, but over time, we're going to bring the water out and a little deeper. We always want to gauge until the plants become established. Imagine the roots are growing about an inch every week out and down. And then once established, depending on the plant material, depending on how big the plant is or how deep that root zone can be, we're going to gauge that water and we want to get that water anywhere from six, eight, 12 inches down. And then we're not watering again until the top few inches has dried out. Not always easy to tell. So how do we know? We have to put our fingers in the soil to see, especially if we've got a nice layer of mulch on top of that soil. That soil, that top is always going to look dry, but when we get our fingers down into that soil, we're going to feel that it's still wet. Now you can also use a uh, a uh, moisture meter, that's fine, but we need to feel the soil because we do not want to water again if the root system is wet because we can then cause those plants to uh, bring up um, stress like root rot, uh, crown rot, and then stress plants will also show signs of more insect pests, more diseases. So it's really important that we are letting the soil dry out a little bit before we water again. And we can only get an idea at the beginning if we're uh, putting our fingers in the soil or feeling it somehow. Now, for those of, the, of us that have irrigation systems, we're going to practice the same practice, okay? We're going to have that irrigation on, and then after the irrigation has been complete, let's say it's 30 minutes, okay? Uh, we're going to go out there and see, has, uh, has the water significantly watered the root zone of my plants? And then before the irrigation timer comes on again in the next few days, let's feel that soil. Do we even need the irrigation to come on again. We don't know. So we have to look and we have to monitor and we need to adjust the irrigation according to the season. These are not set it and forget it systems. And whenever possible, if we've got pop-up sprinklers, we wanna to switch to drip because it's going to be way more efficient. We're gonna save water because a lot of it won't be flying all over the place and evaporating out before it even gets to the soil. We can um, always, we want to set our timers for early in the morning when the air and soil is cool. That's the best time for us to water our gardens if we're watering by hand. And then if we do have an irrigation system, then the best time to set it is really uh, the sunrise hours, that 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., okay? And if we have irrigation systems, it's really important to get out there and check for leaks and malfunctions. We might need to add more emitters or place them in, uh, in different places as the plants grow. Because remember, we want to always focus the water at the edge of the root zone, okay? And then we're going to protect those root zones with a nice layer of mulch. Now, mulch can be either wood chips or I like rice straw in some of my uh, vegetable gardens. Um, that's the garlic on the top right picture. So garlic just grows through that rice straw really easy. But rice straw isn't easy to find. You're going to... Um, you can typically just, you'll have to go to like a feed store, but I like rice straw because it mats down, it's inexpensive and it will break down slowly because it's high in silica. Every else, every other place in my garden, I have wood chips, uh, nice big chunky wood chips. And the reason why I have mulch and why mulch is so important is because soil, it's hydrophobic. If we what happens is soil creates a crust, especially during those really hot baking days of sunlight. That is a nice crust that gets created. And when we do have rain, or if we happen to water with the hose or the sprinkler, that water hits that soil and actually it's going to bead off. It's going to run off because it can't infiltrate. Okay, it takes a minute for it to infiltrate. Just like a hard sponge at the kitchen sink, it actually takes a second for that water to actually infiltrate and soften that sponge up. If we've got a nice 
two to three inch layer of mulch on top of the soil. It's protecting it, now allowing that water to infiltrate with ease. It's also reducing the water evaporation rate significantly. Two inches of mulch is going to reduce the frequency of our watering by at least 20%. It's also going to keep those root zones cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. We just want to keep these uh, any of the mulch away from the plant stems or the crown. And if you need supports, such as tomatoes or cucumbers or green beans or whatever else you're planting, put those supports in when you plant the plants. Do not wait for the plants to grow or you won't have as much, it won't be that easy. It'll be very challenging. So get those uh, cages and trellises and um, stakes in the ground uh, when you've planted your plants and then tie them up accordingly as they grow. And then because we do uh, live in Solano County and there's oftentimes triple digits in the summer, that's not unusual, uh, full sun in our county is really hot. It's hot full sun, right? So even though we're growing full sun food crops, sometimes we need to protect them, especially if we're growing lettuces. Um, because oftentimes lettuces will, uh, they're kind of tender and they could wilt very easily. They could burn really easily. And a lot of times our cooler food crops uh, will bolt faster. So a good way uh, to handle that is to set up some nice uh, shade cloth. Shade cloth, uh, what we can buy is 30% uh, or 40%, no more than 50%. It'll stay on the package. And then we're just going to create a shade canopy, always allowing that air to move through. And that will be perfect. If we've got fruit trees, we're going to paint those trunks with some type of uh, horticulture whitewash material that will prevent sunburn. And then when we do see pests, we always want to properly identify them because as I mentioned, over 90% are actually beneficial. So we want to make sure we can, we can identify who's out there, we can learn their habitat and timing, understand their life cycle, and then understand are there any beneficial insects or natural enemies that are there taking care of that pest for us. We need some support around identifying pests or some support with pest management. We can always go to the Our Water Our World website. We can go to the UCIPM website, which is just a wealth of information for us to really help us identify the pests and manage those pests with the less toxic approach. For assistance with pest identification or bug identification, bugguide.net is really cool. Check that out. And then if we've got pesticides and we want to understand a little bit more how the, the mode of action or how those active ingredients work, I really love going to the National Pesticide Information Center. It was really helpful. And then from there, my two favorite books for gardening is Golden Gate Gardener. Yes, even though this is... Uh, looks like it might be targeted to San Francisco. It is not. It is really targeted for the greater San Francisco Bay Area. And then our uh, Sunset Western Garden um, book of edibles is really fantastic. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. I think I kept it at 45 minutes. You did great. That was wonderful. Thanks so much, Suzanne. So I'm going to stop recording.